Uh, thanks for joining Data Science London today. Um, so today we've got a great meetup um, organised for you. We'll be joining, we'll be joined by uh, the New Day Data Science team, who will be talking us through various credit risk challenges that they've overcome. Um, but just to highlight as well, we've got some upcoming events in January and February. So we've got a sustainable finance hackathon across the 16th and 17th of January. Um, we'll also be joined by a different New Day data science team on the 26th of January, who will be talking about the chatbot they've developed. Um, on the 6th of February, we'll be at the National Museum of Computing, um, carrying out various different challenges and having a talk through some of um, the various historical artifacts they have there. And then on the 17th of Feb, we will be joined by Robin Lester from Microsoft, who will be talking about um, finding and removing bias in ML models. So um, just before I hand over to the New Day team, um, I would just like to highlight, please use the Q&A chat to ask any questions throughout the event. The team will be answering all of your questions as best they can. Um, and just to let you know that the event is being recorded. So I'll hand over to Gail from New Day. Thank you. Thanks uh, and um, welcome everyone. Um, and then thanks for joining us uh, this evening. So uh, I, I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with New Day because that's not uh, a name that uh, we really uh, showcase, uh, but we are really, uh, we are leading a consumer credit company and then we are servicing about uh, actually over 4 million uh, customers in the UK uh, through our, our diverse and growing business. Uh, we have been, uh, so New Day has been existing for about 20 years now. Uh, and then uh, our, our goal really is to, to become the uh, UK's leading uh, digitally enabled consumer finance provider. Uh, and then we want to responsibly saying yes to, to more people and then to develop innovative tools to, to help them uh, stay in control of uh, their, their finance. So we have uh, three own brand products, Aqua and Opus, and Aqua is our main brand for uh, customers that are new to credit. Uh, but we also provide credit card products in partnership with several uh, UK retailers, uh, including uh, Debenhams uh, and then uh, Amazon and AO. Uh, so our, our co-brand products uh, are really there to, to reward uh, customers for, for their brand uh, loyalty with, with our partners. And so we we work closely with, with our partner for, for that. Um, why are, are we uh, here uh, this evening? Uh, really to, to share a nice story that, that we have in, in terms of uh, having successful results in terms of integrating uh, and then leveraging data science uh, with, uh, with the traditional industry, uh, with a significant impact coming from the data science team. Um, and then th those can really inspire uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people in data science um, within uh, the financial sector, but also outside of the financial sector. Um, because we, we really want to, to show how uh, we have been innovating uh, in, in terms of integrating our uh, decision science team, existing decision science team with the, with the data science team. Um, and of course, uh, we also uh, a relatively a small company, but we are recruiting on, on a regular basis. Uh, so sharing what we're about is probably the, the, the best way to, to attract uh, like-minded uh, people. Um, so before we, we move to, to the panel questions, I want to, to introduce the, the team. So I'll, I'll start with, uh, with myself. So I'm uh, Gail Ducanu, uh, Director of uh, Credit Decisioning at New Day. Uh, and Credit Decisioning is covering uh, data science. And, uh, so uh, decision systems, which is where we implement the, the models themselves, but also the, the strategies. Uh, and uh, I'm also covering the credit analytics. Uh, in the data science team, we have uh, today joining us uh, Mark Ismail, who's the head of the data science team. We also have uh, Nupur and David, who are senior managers. 
uh, Alina and Rebecca, who are senior uh, data scientists, and Digan, who is a data scientist. Uh, but I will let them self introduce uh, uh, themselves in, in, in more details uh, before I go over the, the, the panel and the, the plan for the panel for tonight. So, Mark Smell. Yeah, so uh, as Gal mentioned, I'm Mark Ismail, I'm the head of data science team um, that's composed of three senior managers and about nine to ten data scientists. And so um, um, within what Gail has said, our team uh, develops uh, models and decisioning processes to serve the credit, broader credit risk uh, team, which is at the very core of the business of New Day, because uh, as it's a credit company, um, and the team develops a lot, a lot of models spanning customer acquisitions, customer existing customers, and all along the, the, the customer journey. We also do a lot of uh, support of, of other teams when we implement models, and we also look after our models after that they're put live with a really detailed and, and um, um, monitoring that, that we share with the business and, and debrief. And so the team has been built from December 2019, so it's almost a, a year old in, in its current form and, and structure. So, but I'm sure we can discuss more aspects during the panel. Nupur. Hi, I'm Nupur. And Nupur, yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nupur. I'm a senior manager in our Market Smile team. Uh, I, I mainly have about the same background almost. Uh, I've worked in this industry for quite, uh, quite some time now. Uh, joined New Day early in this year, and it's been quite an interesting journey, I think, especially for our entire team, as well as New Day and the kind of models which we have built this year and the impact which it has. Uh, so, yeah, that's almost. Hi, I'm um, David Coggin. I'm a senior manager within the data science team in Marcus Mel's team as well. I've been in uh, New Day for about seven years now. Uh, before that, I was at Experian, uh, building models and working in the credit space. Um, since I've been at New Day, I've moved around at various different teams, looking at scoring in the old uh, decision science space and then in the more strategy space. Uh, moving back into the data science team in the last year, um, which has been a really fruitful experience. Uh, so, yeah. Rebecca? Elena? Oh. Uh, Rebecca? <laughs> okay. um, hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I'm a senior data scientist at New Day. Um, I work in David's team. Um, I've been at New Day for about four years now. Um, similar to David, I've been in a few different teams um, and I was in the original decision science team um, before we sort of migrated to a data science team. Uh, hi, I'm Alina. Um, I've joined New Day um, about a year and a half ago. I was previously working in RBS in a similar kind of uh, team, uh, also building credit risk models, uh, and it has been like a nice, uh, a nice uh, change of uh, change of pace uh, after uh, moving to New Day and getting to explore uh, new techniques. The ground. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Degant. Uh, I've been at New Day for just over a year, so I'm a data scientist in David's team as well. And uh, before that, I was at uni, so this, I don't have a credit risk background, but yeah, I've been here for just over a year. Thank you, Degant. Um, so now on the on the panel question or the, the themes that we want to, to cover uh, today. So you, you have heard that uh, actually uh, some some of the team members have uh, financial sector uh, experience and then have worked in uh, this decision science before. Uh, so so the first theme is really uh, how did we uh, successfully integrate uh, data science with a more traditional decision science approach uh, in a, in a credit setting environment for for modeling. And the, the second one is really in, in terms of the people, because a lot of, of the things that uh, that we're doing and a lot of things that, that we want to do at, at New Day is uh, related to to people and then to to our colleagues. Uh, so what what is that that change or what is that integration uh, means for uh, for team members and then in terms of their personal development uh, and then their uh, um, 
uh, I, their, their uh, relationship with uh, with holders. And then the, the third one is more in, in terms of uh, how, how data science work in, uh, in an environment that is uh, uh, controlled and then regulated and then more regulated than uh, a, a lot of uh, other sectors. So uh, starting with, with the first uh, theme, um, David, um, how would you define the, the transitional uh, decision science approach in, in the credit uh, risk sector? Um, how would I define it? Yeah, um, in terms of you know what uh, decision science traditionally was, it was looking at areas across the whole um, credit life cycle. We'd be looking at customer acquisition scoring. Uh, this is where we get new applications. Uh, we look at existing customer management uh, through to collections where we're trying to um, understand how uh, someone's ability to make repayments and then we also develop models across you know the marketing and fraud segments uh, typically for you know decision science we'd use like internal databases or internal data that we have around the company uh, we'd also lean out to kind of third parties and credit reference agencies um, typically developing the models themselves it'd be uh, quite a manual process in terms of we were very hands-on with it um, this is looking mainly at like manually binning up uh, variables uh, and kind of feeding them into a kind of uh, a logistic or a linear kind of function hoping to get a kind of probability um, of of risk out of the back end of the model um, in terms of identifying like drivers for the models or, or what that would feed into the models that uh, we would tend to flag really useful variables either by genie or, or gain or 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 feeding other known predictors that we would kind of feed into the model, sometimes use dummy models to develop those. But essentially the, the whole function of the decision science element is, is mainly like getting the, uh, the analyst to really mold the model and, and we find these very hands-on. Um, this is helping us understand the characteristics that go into the model, helping us understand the drivers, making, uh, making sure we make sense of all the variables that go in there. If, if anything feels, doesn't feel right, if it's any in, uh, unintuitive trends, uh, could flag uh, data quality issues and which could be primarily through the data itself it could be historical trends that are within the industry it could also represent some system issues that we need to flag in terms of making sure that we understand that that model is going to perform something uh, something similar in a live environment so this is a really good opportunity to identify these kind of changes and, and when we're hands-on with these models um, in terms of the actual models themselves that we develop uh, we'd often look to get an extra benefit by extra segmentation so we would we would pull out certain um, data uh, data segments so if, if a customer uh, or a population of customers would have a good uh, thick penetration on the bureau this means that they've got a lot of active credit existing already and they're quite experienced or if they've had a um, what we call a like a bump in the road experience with with credit previously uh, we might want to segment this population and we would get a more powerful model off the back end of this by focusing on those data items. Uh, as we as we go in terms of the, the actual models themselves, you know, in decision science, we focusing on kind of stability of the model was a real core driver uh, over performance. And that, that was always the case. In the industry that we work in the credit risk space, we are a regulated industry. So it means that, you know, we're highly governed in terms of our models. We, we have to make sure that they're robust, that the, the trends are explainable and that the scoring is is expected and that we can you know defend it so uh, if we use bad information uh, if we see bad information in terms of that we're feeding into the model we would expect that that would have a negative connotation in terms of the model uh, as a scoring item uh, it's also making sure that our models you know consistent and not over model to the sample for example if we're uh, we're looking at a piece of data like for example um, if someone's had a historical default in the past um, an increasing severity of that uh, that information, we would we would expect that an increase in value would would uh, reduce uh, the the score or increase the probability of default at the back end of that model. Um, so this is the kind of consistencies that we're expecting out of the model, and it's something that we really look into when we're doing the decision science stuff. Um, so as I've said previously, you know we're really leaning. Uh, to make sure that we understand the performance, the validity of the models, and then, and when the model's all finished and done, we we have a lot of 
uh, procedures around kind of getting the models implemented and, and more importantly monitoring to make sure that the, the model once it's in a live scenario we understand how it's operating and if any of the drivers are becoming ineffective over time so I hope that answers your question Gail. Thanks David uh, yeah I think that was a really good summary of uh, uh, the I would say the historical uh, approach and the decision science uh, approach. So now, uh, Nupur, uh, what do uh, non-traditional data science approach bring to the table in in, uh, in credit risk? Um, I think uh, for any approach or any new modeling technique, and as David kind of covered, when we are assessing a modeling technique and what it is bringing to the table, the kind of things which we look for is the model performance, its predictive accuracy, which is exact the kind of variables, if they're explainable uh, for each overall globally, as well as uh, you know for key segments and everything. And this is exactly what your non-traditional models are bringing to the table. They are helping us to increase the predictive accuracy uh, of our models, which in turn, which is basically helping us to make better decision for our customers and for our business by understanding exactly how, what kind of risk is associated with each customer. Um, so I think that is kind of the main thing which the non-traditional approaches bring to the table. I think the other kind of view uh, probably at, at it, um, when you look at, uh, you know, when you look at when you say traditional approaches, we are mostly referring to, you know, logistic regression or linear regression approaches where you had, um, uh, you know, had to kind of manually uh, go and bin, so manually go and bin each variable and everything. Uh, if the risk profile, there are, you know, you would have to have multiple models based on different key segments, based on different risk profile and then use the different uh, use variables and bend them differently. I think what the non-traditional approaches probably are giving us is simplifying this. And when you have fewer models, it means you're implementing fewer, mod fewer models, you're spending less time in implementing models. You, you also have to monitor and maintain less models, if that makes sense. I, I think it just uh, like streamlines the process and simplifies uh, the model maintenance and development a lot and also helps us to focus almost, you know, uh, into a bit more innovation and looking into new things, uh, which at the end of the day keeps everyone motivated and happy. Um, Thanks, Dupur. Um, and, and so with, uh, with, with that in mind, uh, Rebecca, what what do you need to think about when uh, when you're playing uh, data science uh, techniques that uh, is in, in terms of the, the the modeling aspect of it? Um, yeah, so if we think about maybe like a, a credit score, um, they tend to range from sort of zero to nine hundred ninety nine, um, and the way they create this range is essentially by building a model to predict the probability of being bad. Um, and then they convert this uh, probability to a score using a log scale. Um, so for example, they could uh, calibrate the model to have equal odds at 600 and points to level odds every 80. So this would mean at a score of 600, you would have a 50-50 chance of being um, bad. Whereas at a score of 520, you would have a 67% chance of being bad. Um, with our internal scores, we calibrate them all to the same range. Um, and this just helps to ensure continuity between models and upgrades. Um, and it also helps around the business because, for example, if we say a score of 300, um, it means sort of the same thing to everyone in every team around the business. They have an expectation about what sort of bad rate you're expecting at that score. Um, there's a couple of reasons why in the financial services sector we use, um, we, we tend to use scores more than probabilities. Um, so, for example, the strategy teams, um, they band up scores in lots of different bands um, and they tend to apply different strategies to each band um, instead of just using like a one solid cut cutoff. Um, using a score instead of a probability, it makes the output less clustered um, and it increases the interpret interpretability around the business as well. Um, because the strategy teams tend to apply these different score cutoffs and different strategies, we need to, one of the main things we need to consider when building a model is the alignment, um, which is essentially how well the model rank orders. 
So if we're increasing the score, does the probability of bad decrease? Um, is there anything else you wanted to cover to Gant on this? So I, I, I think that, that that's uh, that that's a good point. Uh, Digan, do you, do you have more to, to add? Yeah, so uh, another thing we have to look at is explainability, which is essentially how the model works and can we provide transparency on model behavior. So in, uh, since we're a credit lender, we're regulated by the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, is that consumers can challenge our decisions through the FCA. Why we've lent to someone if they feel they can. So, Explainability is a big part of making sure we lend responsibly. And so if a consumer challenges a decision or if the FCA challenges us, we are able to produce some evidence that says typically a consumer with this profile could afford this credit and that's why we've lent to someone. So having explainability means we have transparency in the way we make decisions with our models. Um, so one of the ways we do this, I think David mentioned earlier, trying to ensure we have intuitive trends, which comes kind of from the more traditional decision science world. So one way we do it is by considering monotonicity in scoring, which, um, which means that people are scored in a continuous manner. So if you consider two applicants and the only difference between them on paper is one is in arrears of 50,000 pounds and the other is in arrears of 5,000 pounds, intuitively, we think that the person who's in higher arrears will is less able to afford the credit. And as you move in this range from 50,000 to 5,000, we'd want to make sure that the model improves the credit score, the less arrears someone is in. So enforcing monotonicity, make sure the models are scored continuously and having this explainability allows us to lend responsibly and to explain our decisions to the FCA and to consumers. Thanks, Digant. Uh, and actually, that, that covers uh, one of, uh, or that answers one of the, the questions that were asked in the Q&A. Uh, so I would uh, encourage the audience to uh, ask uh, any question that they have through the, the Q&A function. Uh, another one uh, that is related to, to actually the difference between decision science and, and data science is, uh, uh, about the software uh, that, that we use, um, SAS versus uh, something else, because historically uh, SAS was, was used uh, by uh, the uh, decision scientists. Uh, who want to, to answer that question? Happy to take it, Gail. Okay. Oh, oh, go ahead, Alina. No, no, I'm... I'm sure we would be saying this the same kind of uh, the same kind of thing. Uh, no, so I agree because I come, you know, from a, from a decision science uh, like background. So SAS was the prim the primer primary source, you know, uh, the primary tool that we were using before. Uh, and now I could see, like over time, you know, like after joining New Day, how uh, that primary focus has shifted, you know. Um, towards newer tools, like uh, I think it was mentioned by um, uh, in the question, like tools like um, Python or R. Uh, and I think as you know, that was also driven by the by the change, you know, like in our systems, uh, in our uh, data storage, uh, and we have been um, encouraged, you know, to, to start, you know, uh, adopting uh, more advanced uh, tools or that, you know, can give us, you know, like more options uh, in terms of which methodologies uh, we can use, uh, what kind of models we can build. So it was a combination of the, uh, of our need, you know, to make use of the, the more advanced uh, uh, data sources and also to, to make use of more advanced uh, technology uh, and methodology at the same time. Thanks, Alina. Uh, I, I think that that's a, that's a good lead to our, our second theme, uh, which is uh, related to uh, people and, uh, and, and skills. Uh, so knowing some, some software and knowing SAS or, or now uh, Ethan, uh, is one, but uh, that, that's not the, the only one. And, and, and so Nupur, uh, what, what, what do you think is the right mix of skills for the scientists? Uh, so, so they can operate efficiently in, uh, in, in credit risk. It's a very interesting question, isn't it, Gail? A bit of controversial question as well. 
I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, a data scientist, especially in credit risk environment, because you're kind of involved in such a vari wide variety of activities, uh, it's very different to a data scientist, I would say, in any other sector, because in uh, in this sector, you're involved from, you know, data gathering to model build, implementation, validation, monitoring, everything. So I think, yes, one of the kind main, um, I mean, if we talk about the right mix of skills in uh, credit risk or uh, in this area, I would say one of the key thing is, uh, you know, a background and good knowledge in statistics, data science, uh, analytics and everything. Obviously, as we covered a knowledge of the softwares, um, Python, not SaaS anymore. Um, these, these are kind of the knowledge is important, as, but also the practical application of it almost having the, you know, the thing about understanding, uh, understanding the data, understanding the key trends, what to look for, having the presence of mind almost, I would say, uh, is also very important in that. Um, I think in addition to that, um, since we are kind of working in such a regulated environment, the knowledge of the business uh, knowledge of what you can and cannot do in a regulated space uh, is quite important. And I, I know that it, it's something which you kind of develop over the years working in, in that particular field, but you also want to have the curiosity to learn, curiosity to challenge the existing processes, which will help you kind of uh, in this specific sector. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's I would that I would say that is kind of the key one. Um, obviously, also communication is quite important, which is which is quite important in most of the sectors, but especially in our sector because we are working into very complex model. We are building quite complex models, but to explain these complex models to stakeholders uh, and our customers is quite important in a very simplistic way. So I think those are the kind of key things, three things I would say: the knowledge of uh, you know statistics, data science, analytics knowledge of business and a bit, uh, the interest to learn more about the business and third, uh, communication of the results. Um, Marcus Mal, uh, since you have kind of developed this team from scratch, uh, is there something else you would think uh, is that goes in the right? Um, I, think, I, think, I think you you, you you definitely said all the elements already in Upua. I just said, I think that as in any sector, basically to be an efficient data scientist, you need to be able to have your numerical skills, your coding skills, your machine learning skills, statistics, skills, et cetera. And also a strong business understanding uh, to be able to be an efficient data scientist. You know, otherwise you, you just basically have put the numbers and you know that this link is, is essentially also challenging because obviously it, it's pretty complex what we do at the end of the day and to represent that in terms of you know, business and business value and, and put that into a process to, to make it really fruitful and implement it you know, down the line in terms of business process and, and concrete implementation is challenging. So, so I'd say in the credit risk sector, from, I've had experience in the media sector and the retail sector uh, in R&D when I was a, a bit younger. And I would say that the, the specificity of the credit risk environment is that this is so much the this is so much better around people's behaviors that you have a lot of kind of unwritten Bible that is compiled in the in the heads of those who've been you know long enough in that sector around how customers behave to, to really un interpret uh, all the aspects kind of, of the model. Yeah, you kind of have to be the driver of your own personal development to be. Yeah, to be able to get all of that, yeah. and so I think that that's is really specific in terms of uh, in terms of the sector and then to be effective data scientist you have to have a, a kind of explicit uh, intention and take explicit steps toward getting that otherwise it pretty quickly becomes uh, a bit challenging thanks mark smell uh, i think that uh, maybe digan you, you can also provide uh, a couple of examples uh, personal example uh, because, w w like, given given your your background, you didn't work in uh, in uh, any other uh, company before. Uh, so, what what among all of the skills, uh, like hard skills and soft skills, which which ones did you find 
the hardest to, to acquire and then to apply in, uh, in this type of environment? Yeah, so I think, uh, as Nupur said, it kind of depends on each individual's kind of curiosity to learn. Um, personally, I like to have a big picture view of things if I'm working on something and try to understand as much as possible around a task I'm doing. And yeah, as you said, I didn't have any financial services back. And I didn't know half of the like acronyms and stuff people were using, but it's something you pick up with experience. Um, I can't really comment outside of New Day, but I think the way the size of the business and also the way our data science team is structured in the business means we get a lot of exposure to different arms of the business around credit risk. And because of the size of the business, we interact a lot with our stakeholders. We can really understand what they need out of a model, which informs our model builds and ensures that we kind of understand how our work is used by the wider business and provides um, a lot of context. So I've been here for only just over a year and I've built a fraud model. I've been involved in collections, in acquisition or customer underwriting and um, yeah, and customer management as well. So I think it, it there's a lot of on the job learning you have to do and sort of including just reacting to changes in prioritization because things can change very fast. But yeah, I, I think in particular with New Day, you, you do get a lot of exposure because of the size of the business and your close interaction with stakeholders. And on top of that, we do have initiatives like we had New Day Academy uh, that started during the lockdown where um, people from different parts of the business would present to, I think it was to the credit decisioning team around the team. We had people from like customer management, from collections in various parts of the business presenting what work their team does and how it affects the business and what kind of how it aligns with the aims of the business as a whole. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's my experience. Yeah, and I, I think I'll just jump in and kind of add to that. Like in terms of we've uh, we've been recently hiring, uh, looking at like new candidates and, and it kind of expanding the, the data science team. And, um, you know, in terms of what we've been looking for, like in, in, in terms of good candidates, is what they bring to the table is like what Degant touched on in terms of that curiosity and that enthusiasm uh, to kind of learn and understand the business. I think where we, you know, where it's not worked so well in the past is is where there's been a little ignorance towards the data or assuming that data comes in a nice polished box and that we just push it for a function and we get a model that we can just. Uh, wash our hands off and, and then there's the value add to the business in terms of you know like what good candidate for a data science for us is is that they get kind of stuck in yeah we build the models yes and we we really want to push in terms of expanding our data science expertise and this is around you know yes there is machine learning yes there is like uh, scope for potentially looking into you know um, deep learning and all that but we, we have to build our models, we have to gather the data, we have to, you know, we have to clean the data and we have to maintain the models and, and track those models as, as well as implementing in the, the system. We're, we're still a relatively small company and a small team in that sense. So, um, you know, there's lots of kind of exposure and on the job experience. So, you know, a, a kind of uh, a data science or a, um, or a computer science specialist only is not going to get you too far in this business. It's about broadening that in terms of get, making sure that we get that business understanding in and, and make sure that we can round that off with a, a, a analytical edge. Thanks, David. Uh, and I think that, that you actually answered uh, one of the, the, the questions we had on the, uh, what would makes a, a good data science or what, what, what would be the, the, the perfect hire. Um, I think that, um, Digant, uh, David, and then Nupur uh, mentioned uh, something around uh, stakeholders, and we have a couple of questions uh, around stakeholders as well. Uh, so, um, Alina, what, what what do you think is uh, in, in, in making a, a successful uh, stakeholder relationship uh, in uh, in our environment? Um, yeah, first of all, I'm not sure, like, um, maybe it's worth mentioning, like, who our stakeholders are. Uh, so, in a nutshell, like, in my opinion, the stakeholders are uh, either the people who are going to use uh, what we produce, either if, if it's a model or if, if it's a model or um, in, in the form of a score or a probability. Um, but also, we, 
we consider stakeholders the people who are helping us uh, deliver this model and making sure that it gets implemented so that uh, the front end, uh, so it can be used at front end. Um, and for the purpose of that, you know, like in order to make sure that uh, we all meet our common goal here, uh, which is delivering this model, uh, which also has to be something, you know, that is fit for purpose for, for all our stakeholders. Uh, we try to engage, you know, like as much as possible and as early as possible as well. Uh, we try to, to meet, you know, like from the start uh, to try to understand the needs um, of our stakeholders, which can be uh, either, you know, the, the credit risk strategy team or the commercial team who might have, uh, you know, quite different interests, you know, and quite uh, uh, different uses for the score that we produce. I think this is actually something that m was touched upon, like in one of the, the other questions uh, uh, in the Q&A section. Uh, and it, it can be indeed, you know, like uh, challenging at times, you know, to make sure that uh, everyone, you know, uh, reaches a, a common understanding and a common um, agreement, you know, like on what we want uh, the model to do. Um, but yeah, as long as we set our goals clear from the beginning and then have regular uh, meetings, you know, to make sure that uh, we're still on track and, uh, you know, all the challenges that we might encounter along the way, um, uh, we try to use, you know, like our uh, different expertise, you know, to try to reach like a common uh, agreement. Um, but yeah, as I said, you know, like, even though I've been focusing a lot, you know, like on the working together part, but I think it's also important, you know, like to keep uh, the boundaries as, you know, like we are each expert, you know, like in our own uh, areas uh, and we have to, to know like where to draw the line, you know, like between uh, working together and everyone, you know, like get, getting to have an input uh, into what's happening and, you know, uh, allow ourselves, you know, to, to do what we know best as well. I'm not yeah, sure think, if that's, if yeah, that's, no, the, I, uh, I think that, that, that uh, that's a really good, uh, really good point. Uh, but I, I will also add, uh, David, given his uh, specific point of view, because he was in uh, decision uh, science before, then moved to uh, the analytics team and like uh, doing uh, building the, the strategies, which is uh, one one of the, the key uh, stakeholders team, uh, and then then uh, move back to uh, the um, uh, decision science uh, data science team. Um, what 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 what's your view on that, David? And uh, uh, how how do you think that uh, stakeholders can be uh, convinced or educated about uh, the, the models because that was one of the questions. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, Alina mentioned as well, in, in terms of um, setting up boundaries, everyone's an expert or everyone thinks they're an expert and, and tries to, they've touched scoring in the past or they've done stuff a certain way. Um, we obviously have challenges within the team in terms of uh, managing our, our own workloads and whether that's, you know, setting up the, the project or whether it's running through the models or whether it's and making sure that we, we get the right level of input into the model so that we can actually deliver on time in terms of uh, meeting these deadlines. I guess it, I, it is a difficult, you know, kind of transition when you, you've come from an area um, where they've moved out of a scoring team, for example, and they're now a stakeholder uh, within those teams. And they feel that they, they know how to build a model or, or want to dictate how the model is being built. And I feel that, you know, in terms of managing that balance and making sure that we've got the uh, we're leaning into expertise where they do have expertise uh, and making sure that we do, do not disregard that because everyone's got different uh, rounded experiences in terms of what they've worked on and it might be more applicable than others. But it's also making sure that they respect us as well uh, to do our job and know that we can build our model uh, to the standard that we know um, it needs to be. And we've got procedures in place in terms of making sure that that is a high quality model and we've got you know, second line and other um, checkpoints to make sure that the, the models that we build are, you know, robust and, and fit for purpose within the business. I guess in terms of me personally, it does give me an edge knowing how, 
you know, in terms of how the model will be used at the other end, uh, when in terms of the stakeholders and the kind of the challenges that they face into. So what I uh, try to do there is, is try to preempt to make sure that we front load those questions and considerations uh, a lot into the scoping phase to make sure that we're, we're asking the steer head questions to, to get those inputs that we want. So we're not causing delays down the line. Um, so whether this is if, if it's certain parameters that we want to feed into the model or if it's certain products and channels that we need to cater for or whether it's an infrastructure in terms of the actual systems that the model is going to be used in um, is it a case of that for example we use credit bureau data you know they might have a different calling phase in terms of the multiple um, bureaus that we access and they might want to call one at one in one case and, and not for certain types of clusters so it's making sure that we uh, we understand the strategy is to make sure that we're building models that are fit for purpose at the end of the day. Um, I can't pretend that, you know, I have all the answers that they're working on in terms of their forward, forward looking strategy, but I've certainly got a good grounded in terms of what the base strategy might look like. And if we can lead into scoping sessions and, and lean into discussions at the back end of the model to make sure that they're having the right dialogue with us, it means that it makes the model better for them. And it means that we save a lot of time by having those discussions on the table. Yeah, that, that's uh, that, that's a good point, David. Um, and I think you, you mentioned good uh, good relationship with uh, with stakeholders, and then a good relationship uh, definitely comes with uh, successful models, and then uh, models that that make an impact to the business. Uh, so I, uh, they, we we have one question uh, from uh, from the audience uh, around uh, most common failures in attempt of, of modeling create risk across the sector not not just for for new day uh, who wants to uh, pick that question and and, uh, and try to answer it i can pick it um i will ask you to repeat the question though sure uh, what is the most common failure in attempts uh, to to build uh, models i think the most common failure occurs when you don't spend enough time understanding the data uh preparing the data uh Data is everything. If you understand all the key decisions of how you're preparing your sample or your population, what are the variables, what are the outcome flags? If you understand that, you would be successful in building the model as well. Um, and I think communication of these things to stakeholders as well and keeping them in loop uh, for all the decisions which you have made throughout would help you avoid, to avoid those, if that makes sense. Do you think that answers the question? Yeah, okay. it, it does. Uh, anyone else? No, I, I think I was going to say the exact same point to Nepal. I think data is king in this scenario. I've seen so many times when, when there's been delays caused by people making assumptions about data or not um, doing the certain level of checks to make sure that the, you know, the data is going to look like it is in a live environment um, because um, we, we often not want to access new data sources. We might use a, a retro from a third party uh, to get a retrospective uh, uh, view of, of new upgraded services that they might offer. And sometimes the settings are slightly different and sometimes there's assumptions of in terms of what's been uh, commercially agreed in terms of what we're actually going to proceed with the actual um, data going forward. So if we don't understand the data uh, or what the data is going to look like going forward, we can't build the model that's going to be uh, best fit for that scenario. So. That's why like, you know, in the beginning when we covered that you need to have like a good knowledge of analytics, data science, statistics, but just having the knowledge and putting it in practice are quite different things, I would say. Yeah. I I would also add that um, failures can, can sometimes come by uh, the, the fact that um, models are, are delivered very late or products take uh, forever to, to be delivered. And there is actually one, one question related to that. Um, what, what type of delivery methodology do you use? Uh, is it lean or do you use uh, a, another uh, a, approach? Who would like to, to pick that one? I'm happy to pick that one. I think we use the ASAP method, which is to get stuff as soon as possible. Uh, but 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 I think we we almost have two tracks now that the team is a bit more mature. 
um, in terms of its, you know, it's been built, has processes, etc. I think there's clearly two types of, of, of models because it's the most of what the team does that, that we deliver. There are the really heavy hitters model that we really want to deliver for the business and help our strategy colleagues in putting their decisioning and, and, and putting definitely for implementation. So those models, we definitely have a, a, a classical scoping with stakeholders, planning, delivery in iterations. Um, that's, it's not a two week sprint, but it's at the model level, it's like four to six week. Uh, and then we have all the approval, et cetera, governance process we can talk after. So that's really for our heavy hitters models. But as a data science team, obviously we also want to try a lot of things and, and are trying more and more things. So this is then more of a POC um, type of format uh, that, in which we progress some ideas and we don't have a formal process around scoping that, etc. It's something we can do more internally and then share with stakeholders only if, if there's interest. And in that case, if there's interest, it can become a more more formal, it can go into a more formal process, but there's really two tracks, but it's, it's essentially agile and, and, and pretty interactive as a process. So, you know, the managers and data scientists that work on a model once your first iteration is out about that, you start talking to your stakeholders, get feedback on your variables, get feedback on performance. You talk to our enterprise risk colleagues, external auditors. And so it, it, it becomes a, a very, um, a very kind of intense back and forth sometimes when you have a delivery date to, to form. But, but essentially, that's the, the picture of how the team operates. Uh, smart smell. And then, then uh, once the, the, the model is, is developed and is approved, uh, it needs to be uh, implemented. Um, and then one question around that, uh, how do you approach pro productionization of uh, data science models? What, what's the split of responsibilities uh, between uh, data science and uh, uh, decision systems? So uh, I think like in any, you have many models for 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 designing uh, the organization around that you know you have models where uh, the de devops and data engineers are directly part of the data science team or you have another model like ours where we are sister teams and i think both have pros and cons i think the model we have at new day works you know pretty well uh, in that it's a it's a sister team but with which we have a, a clear process so when we once we have a model approved it's approved as a as a statistical object, if you'd like, and has been extensively reviewed by a lot of people, then to, to actually implement that, we work uh, with an implementation owner, uh, if you'd like, who actually implements the model, uh, would um, um, also deal with all the systems downstreams, etc., and the data scientists who's worked on the model, obviously will support in terms of explaining the variables, try and solve you know, the usual problems you encounter in implementation of efficiency, of matching the results, et cetera. So it's uh, as a structure is, is to assist the teams, but as a process, it's very much a kind of, you know, hold hand until um, completion uh, and um, always in a very collaborative way, because as probably many of people who are on the call know, you. you you can't really implement a model successfully if you don't have a strong involvement of the data science team supporting that because there's just too many it's just too complex an object a model to be just being or written on a piece of paper so we definitely take a, a really collaborative approach there and i think especially in this sector you if anything goes wrong it's quite uh, uh what do you call it it's very damaging almost as compared to any other sector, so we have to really pay special attention to the implementation. Yeah, and, and I think we, we have also a, a very specific setting where uh, decision system and then data science uh, sit in, in, in the same uh, overall team. Uh, that really allows uh, that that interaction that that you mentioned and that collaboration, and so we we don't have the, the same friction as in some other setting where you have IT versus the the, the business. Uh, so everything is, is pretty fluid. People sit together and then and work together. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so so I think we we have quite a few elements uh, uh, around uh, successful uh, implementation or successful uh, development of, of models. So uh, one, one aspect that we wanted 
to cover that uh, we have not really uh, uh, dived into uh, so far is uh, how, how to work in a regulated uh, environment. Um, so given the, the regulated environment, we, we need to, to oper operate under, uh, like the, the first question and that that's like a, a, almost a, a too simple of a, of a question, but uh, David, do you think you do uh, just uh, whatever you, you want? Uh, no, unfortunately we can't just do anything we want. Um, like, like you mentioned, um, yes and, well, yes, there is, I guess there is an element to that, um, that we can, we can kind of explore elements of that. Um, within the data science space, we're still operating within a regulated company. We still have to uh, act responsibly. We, are, you know, we. This means that we have to. Um, um, we're held up against responsible lending, so it means that we have to be able to justify to our customers why we've lent to them. And this isn't always a case of of why we've said no to someone. Sometimes it's a case of why we've said yes to someone because they might further down the road they might have gotten themselves into financial difficulties. And it might be that we've lent them credit when they're at a very vulnerable time. So it's uh, it's holding ourselves up accountable against that kind of position as well. So we need to make sure that our models are transparent, that we're saying, hey, look, we, we've seen uh, customers like Person X and, and for you know uh, Y, Z reasons that we think that that customer was appropriate to, to lend to it within our models. So um, I think one of the questions asked this as well is does it, uh, constrain the models in terms of the technicality. Yes, it does constrain some of the complexities at the moment, but as, as I think uh, Mark Ismail mentioned, we're still a relatively new team in terms of like the data science space. The industry is very, very new in terms of uh, getting comfortable with these technologies and getting used to uh, kind of uh, having the transparency in a, in a slightly different way. The logistic and linear models were really clear in terms of scorecards. At this point, you would get this. At this point, you would get this. And it was super clear to kind of understand that we've got different techniques of looking into that, but uh, we still need to make sure we understand what's going under the hood there. Um, in terms of the models themselves, they need to be reproducible as well. So we can't just click yet, run on a piece of data and, and you know, a score comes out that, that could mean something. We need to be able to reproduce the results and make sure that we sign off the, the results of that. Um, and then in terms of um, the actual uh, scores, you know, the portfolio is growing a lot, the, it's changing all the time. So making sure that we have a kind of two, handle, uh, two hands on the steering wheel, uh, being able to um, model these customers and make sure that we produce outputs that are uh, responsible and solid um, means that we, we kind of have to have a, a bit of control on that. And in terms of the actual data science, can we do stuff? Yes, we can lean into a lot of the techniques that are coming. Uh, there's a lot coming down in terms of the open source stuff. Uh, and it's not saying we, that it's a closed door on that. We can lean into it in certain aspects of the model building process, or whether it's you know uh, the feature or the variable selection processes, or in terms of how uh, some of the different algorithms in, in terms of the modeling techniques, we can do lots of POCs in terms of it's a certain area. And we can look into these techniques and if they have weight, then yes, let's explore it. And I think we've got that kind of uh, flexibility to move into that space. So, um, and I guess with that, it means that as we start to move and get more comfortable in moving uh, around the data science space, it means that the, uh, the business gets a lot more confident in our ability. And it means that they become um, not so much getting up to speed with what we're doing, but it's making sure that we bring them on the journey. If we jumped into uh, bringing in a team and going into a very abstract, you know, deep learning scenarios, it, it, they would suddenly go from a world where they have uh, quite good visibility in terms of what's going on to an absolute black box. And I think that's not where we need to be. And I think we can kind of go on that journey, um, trying different things out. So a uh, bit of a wishy-washy answer, I'm afraid, Gail, but, uh, but there is something there. No, no. Thanks, David. Um, and then, so in, in, in terms of the, the actual uh, steps and, and, and process that, that you need to, to follow uh, to build a model in uh, in a regulatory uh, environment like, like the, the one we have. Uh, Rebecca, we have not heard too much from you yet. Uh, so could could you actually cover the, the steps for us? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have quite a structured approach to model development. 
um, I think as mentioned previously, um, before we actually start the model development, we have um, meetings with some key stakeholders to understand um, the behaviors that they want to capture in the model, if there's any particular features that might be of interest to them um, and sort of how they're gonna use the model once it's complete. Um, in this stage, we also tend to engage with the implementation team um, just to ensure that the variables and modeling techniques are compatible with the implementation system. Obviously, we don't want to complete a model build and then find out that we can't implement it in the original system. Um, within the model development itself, um, we continually update stakeholders with information around the variables that we've selected um, or perhaps variables that we've dropped um, and reasons why they've been included or excluded. Um, and it kind of gives the stakeholders a chance to feed into the development stage um, in case they're seeing any variables that strongly interact with their strategies um, or perhaps have an unexpected behavior. Um, obviously, they'll ask questions during this stage um, and we'll try our best to answer them. So perhaps they'll want to see performance on a specific key segment of interest to them. Um, we then, after we've finished the model development, we have a detailed code review. Um, so it's not only a code review, but it's a review of the model um, and also the outputs. Um, and this is for the most material models, this is with um, an external auditor. Um, and after that's complete and everyone's happy with it, it gets sent to a committee for approval, which has uh, representatives from each, each stakeholder group. And essentially that is where the model is signed off um, and everyone agrees that they're comfortable to use the model. Um, it then goes on to the implementation stage um, and we engage again with this team uh, just to ensure that it's implemented in line of expectations. Um, this is a particularly key point uh, or key stage of the process um, because we need to ensure that the model that's implemented is an exact replica of the model that was agreed and signed off. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. thanks a lot, Rebecca. Um, but building the mold is not uh, everything in, in, uh, in a, a regulated uh, environment. Uh, Nupur, uh, which are the other things that we need to, to do this, uh, in, uh, in the financial sector? Um, I think uh, just a couple of things more to add to what Rebecca said. Um, obviously, as I've kind of specified a couple of times, the data preparation is kind of the biggest stages. Once we have the model, we also have a very extensive validation process to ensure that the model actually validates across different time periods, different key segments. It is exactly behaving as we would expect. The trends are completely explainable. And especially when we are, you know, verging towards non-traditional data uh, science approaches or non-traditional model development approaches, we need to explain kind of everything and validate it across quite thoroughly. And then obviously go through the review process, uh, the internal second line review process before we actually get the model approved. Um, once the model is kind of approved, uh, we have a thorough implementation process. And once I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the implementation process, which is, which in itself is a big job because you're not just trying to implement the uh, log, log, logic of the model, but you're also matching exactly every variable of, to match how you had developed the model. And if it is scoring exactly the same segments you want to uh, score and everything. Um, but after that, I think uh, one of the key stages is actually monitoring, model monitoring and tracking the model month on month based on different models, different use cases and materiality. You want to ensure that your model is performing consistently across the across you know uh, as you're using it and it's exactly doing how uh, it's exactly being used in the right way even in strategies and it's uh, producing the correct output is stable um, so I think that's almost the um, things which sit outside the model development the maintenance and implementation of it um, um, Alina is, is there something which maybe I missed out uh, you think? Uh, no, I think most of the things have been covered already, like in previous uh, uh, answers, you know, like the data preparation part, you know, like uh, it's quite a big step, you know, like and it happens, you know, before the model development where we decide, you know, like what's the, uh, the representative sample to build on, what should be our target, 
because of the regulated aspect of our business, uh, we tend to spend like a, a more time, a bit more time on that uh, with probably other industries. And we also do like a validation um, on an out of time sample uh, before the model gets approved. Uh, because we can't, with all you know the um, uh, the complexities of the process, we don't redevelop these models very frequently. So we have to make sure that the one that we build is applicable and uh, performs well, like on any other uh, time samples as well. I think we also maybe yeah. something to add there is providing support to the strategy teams uh, to understand these models and to enable or help them to successfully. Uh, develop their strategies on top of these models. Thanks, uh, Nupur and uh, Anina. I think we have time for one one last question. Uh, so there's one question on uh, which uh, BI and data visualization tool do you use to communicate the impact of your model to three? Who would like to pick that one up? I'm happy to pick it. So, so, so I think the, the way the way we communicate the, the the model to stakeholders, if you'd like an internal clients, I guess it, it really depends at which stage you are. So when it's um, when it's um, when the model is being built, we usually don't build a BI for that because uh, we, we can just share ad hoc analysis, which generally is pretty extensive. It's pretty thick decks with just lots of numbers because we really should like dissect the model in every possible way to, to be able to, to, to provide assurance to the, our stakeholders and strategic colleagues that it's fit for purpose, you know, it, it doesn't do anything wrong. So I guess in the modeling stage, we don't necessarily do that. Now at the monitoring stage, um, we're you know, obviously um, providing detailed granular uh, view of how the model performs we do that through you know sometimes just plain on excel it works but we we're working on the on the, on the back end to create um, more interactive tools for, for for both us and our stakeholders to have uh, uh, to be able to navigate the model performance if you'd like recent model performance so we you know we're looking at the usual tableau and and similar tools um, and we build that you know on the side of what we do Thanks a lot, Mark Smell. So I think that uh, it's time to use this panel. Uh, thanks a, a lot for all of your participation and thanks audience for all of your questions. Um, and uh, thanks for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yes. Bye. Yeah. Do we just leave?